1247, in the afternoon of the 10th day of May in the year 1806, a place called Promontory Summit, Utah Territory, didn't finish it. They began it, and it's still going on. on the last spike had been a long time coming. Grass. A vast, a thousand miles and more, waiting. From the broad Missouri River bottom, it stretches. 500 miles of high plains and blowing grasslands, reaching up to the unknown and frightening Great Stony Mountains. The unexplored wonders of the Yellowstone country, rainforests, timber and lush green valleys of the new Northwest. Waiting, waiting while the colonists eked out a foothold on the Atlantic shore. California's waiting too, known only by sea captains and Spanish missions for centuries. Waiting while the new nation grows. A thousand miles and more of promise waiting. My name is Long. Major Stephen H. First Officer, U.S. Army Topographical Engineers, Department of the Missouri. In 1820, I led a scientific expedition from the Missouri River to the Rocky Mountains. Lewis and Clark had gone on before, more to the north. Our troop of botanists, geologists, and engineers had gone to evaluate this land in the interest of the Union. We move on. The air is hot, like a desert. In my report, that will be this country's name and on the maps we make. The Great American Desert, founded on the east by the Missouri River and on the west by the Rocky Mountains, shall be known as the Great American Desert. We are not the first, and we are not the last. Trappers, fur traders, missionaries, and other explorers will come, but the settlers, no, the settlers won't come. Perhaps it is our desert they fear. Perhaps so, Major Long. Your description of the region is gospel for many years, and the settlers don't come. But they come to the east. From Europe, they come to the east and fill up the cities. Between 1800 and 1860, more than five million come, packed like cattle in the steerage. Herded through immigration. Stacked six stories deep on New York's Lower East Side. They fill up the cities and they dream of land. There is land in the West. 
word comes back of rich farming land in Oregon. Oregon fever, Oregon or bust. A few thousand break away from the crowded east. And then, gold, gold in California. California, here we come. miles, 15 miles a day. We left Missouri 81 days ago, and I figure with luck, we'll make it in another three months. One foot in front of the other. That's the only way to do it. It's a hard way, no doubt. There's good land along the way, and we're tempted to stop. But there's no way to get our crops to market. And there's no way to get our supplies. Back east, there's riverboats and railroads. But there's no railroad here, that's for sure. And the rivers are few and far between. And so it goes. The westward movement wagons west. Moving through, but not yet to that thousand miles of promise. Before this land can ever be settled, the West needs transportation, and it needs it now. Not the sort to miss this choice opportunity, the voices of the politicians are raised. 1850, Illinois Senator Stephen A. Douglas. The tide of emigration and civilization must be permitted to roll onward. Decisive measures should be adopted immediately to ensure the completion of this great railroad communication. Missouri Senator Thomas Hart Benton echoes the call. I should be in favor of seeing an army of laborers employed upon it at once. There would be room for 50,000 men to work without elbowing each other. Douglas says, let it begin in Illinois. Benton says, let Missouri be its source. Others champion Wisconsin. Jefferson Davis, Secretary of the Army, soon to be the President of the Confederate States, has his own preference. The route of the 32nd parallel is the most practicable and economic route for a railroad. Each section of the country wants the railroad to be its own. Soon it becomes North versus South, and the railroad becomes another issue driving the nation apart. Northern route versus southern route. The drums grow louder. Slave versus free. Abolition. Anger. And then... Fort Sumter is fired on. April 12th, 1861. The great national tragedy. Three weeks later, 11 southern states have seceded. In Washington, Southern congressmen pack their bags and head for home. If anything good can be said to have come from brother fighting brother, it is this. All opposition to a northern route for the great national enterprise vanishes when the South secedes. July 1st, 1862, Abraham Lincoln signs the Pacific Railroad Act. The line of said railroad shall commence in the territory of Nebraska, thence running westerly upon the most direct route to meet and connect with the Central Pacific Railroad Company of California. And the Central Pacific Railroad is authorized to construct a railroad from the Pacific Coast to form a continuous line of railroad from the Missouri River to California. Omaha shall be the starting point, a raw frontier village huddled on the Missouri River mudflats. With much hoopla and ballyhoo, ground is broken. And work grinds to a halt almost at once. There is no money. There are no investors. Major Long's great American desert is still too much with them. Congress must act again. The land grant is doubled. 
On the battlefield, the North is finally victorious. Lee surrenders. Peace. The nation looks west. And another great national drama begins. From Omaha we started, barely a thousand men strong. By the time we were done, we were 10,000 strung out for a good 200 miles across Indian territory. The Thai gangs went ahead putting down the ties and we came behind laying down the rails, pushing the end of track ahead of us. It was a real international enterprise. Rails come from Pittsburgh, the ties from Wisconsin, and the sweat from Ireland. The graders went on ahead preparing the way, stringing up the bridges and cutting down the hills. Those fine boys did it the hard way, with a pick and mule cart and a good aim shovel. Oliver Ames was president of the railroad, you know. And we come behind us, swarming across the plains, laying the iron in place. We made good time. Some days we laid three miles a track, some days more. Christmas 1867, we, we spent in Cheyenne, freezing half to death. That weren't enough. Those Diver Redskins took their share of blood. We kept a thousand rifles and used them more than once. Ah, but they were good times too. The photographers came and took our picture and we'd shine up the engine and all look important. And on payday, <laughs> well, that was a time to let go. Those canvas towns that followed us had plenty of ways to spend our money. Next year, we didn't stop. That was 1868. He was in the mountains and it was tunnel and blast, pitch and chop, and the devil take the hindmost. In the spring of 69, then we were free and clear and racing toward the Central Pacific boys across the Utah Territory. Promontory, Utah Territory a windswept, desolate place where the two halves of this nation are to be joined. Wooden shanties line promontories one street, the sap still dripping from their green wood. Officials and construction engineers from both lines are here. The great event is near. The rest of the nation will hear the message by telegraph. The last rail is set, and the last iron spike is driven home. Prayers are offered. We have got done praying. The word is tapped out coast to coast. And exactly at 12.47 p.m. Chicago, the word is heard, done, done. Bells ring in San Francisco, done. And the crowds cheer in Washington. To all the world, done. The Pacific Railway is done. Oscar F. Davis is my name. You never heard of me, but if I do say so myself, I've done more to tame the West than Fat Masterson and Wild Bill Hickok rolled together. You see, I was land commissioner for the railroad, and that means get out and sell the lands, boy. Bring the settlers in. Oscar F. Davis tamed the West. To do it, I use posters like this. And like this. Printed millions of them. You can't run a railroad without people to ship their freight on it to ride on it. And we brought them. I sent my agents all over the East to sell the West. Sent them to Europe even. Settle in the West. That's what we told them. 
Gave them maps and books and rich farming lands, free lands, cheap lands. We didn't care if they bought our lands or homesteaded free. As long as they came, and they did. You bet they came. We built special cars. We even gave them special trains. Sent out guides with them to help them find the land. Train loads full of settlers. By 1879, I'd sold nearly two million acres, hundreds of thousands of people. By 1880, Nebraska's population stood at 450,000. And I take some pride in that. Those weren't just numbers, Mr. Davis. Those were families like mine. We came in 79, dirt farmers. And we took this land and we made it provide. The sod we broke. With it, we built our home. There's no timber, so we use sod. Perhaps not much to look at, but it was our own. Others built the towns. Drugstores, groceries, blacksmiths, and schools. Further west, it was cattle. Millions of head coming to your railroad. And the crops, ah, oh, they were good. Corn and wheat. The crops, the towns, the homes, we made them and we made families. We multiplied and we made this land. Through it all were the trains, your trains, Mr. Davis. You and us, we had a kind of partnership. The settlers and the trains. We were a long way from nowhere out here on your desert. We needed you to get our crops to market. You needed us, too. You know you did. Without us, you'd go broke. That was our partnership. And through it all are the trains, opening new land to the settler's plow. They tie the raw frontier to the hungry markets of the east, bringing more people to the land, still building, not satisfied with one main line, through the 70s, through the 80s, into the 90s, pushing out branch lines. And the land grows up. There are good years, and the wagons creak with their load. And the land grows up. Bad years. Grasshoppers. They ate the crops right down to the ground. They were so thick we couldn't see the sky. They ate the rope on the bucket, the bark on the trees. They ate everything. And there are good years and the horses strain at their loads. And bad years. Sometimes the rains didn't come. Only the sun. And then dust. Then, panic, financial panic. The banks fail in 73. Farm prices plummet during the 80s. The Union Pacific has joined the Union to the Pacific, has brought hundreds of thousands of settlers to the West. But it isn't enough. Transcontinental railroads begin to fail. And on October 13, 1893, the end to the first act for Union Pacific comes. Reorganized and sold at auction on the steps of the Omaha Freight House, the new leaders and new money are headed by a small man with a large mustache, Edward Henry Harriman. Harriman inspects his new property. He meets the people who run it, and he impresses them. I've been a railroader all my life, and my father before me, but the first time I met that fellow Harriman, I'll never forget. He wore little rimless glasses, and those eyes, they could look right through you. He was an Easterner, and he knew his business. And what he didn't know, he surely set out to learn. Do you know what he did? Right, right off, he has an observation car tied on a locomotive, and he has himself pulled, slowly, mind you, and only during the day, all the way from Omaha to the Pacific Ocean. And he asks questions. What weight are those rails? 
How much corn will those cars hold? He learned the railroad. 1898, and Harriman returns to New York. $25 million is the initial outlay to rebuild rusting tracks and replace aging equipment. New bridges, tunnels, fill in the valleys, level off the hilltops, replace the rail, the ties, the roadbed. And when it is done, Harriman has rebuilt the Union Pacific, rebuilt as he foresees for a vastly expanding West. And to quicken that expansion, Harriman goes to the farmer's aid. Men like Farmer Smith are hired to spread the gospel of better farming methods. Rolling colleges of agriculture whistle stop to curious crowds from Bonner Springs, Kansas to Union Gap, Washington. The latest in farm equipment, how to grow better potatoes, wheat, sugar beets, and how to dress up your apples from tree to pie. Food, it's needed soon enough and in enormous quantities. The war to make the world safe for democracy puts the test of fire to Harriman's rebuilt Union Pacific. Doughboys heading for over there and the munitions to back them up. Soon the nation's rail system is clogged Though Union Pacific's modernized operation is equal to the challenge, other roads bog down. In crisis, President Woodrow Wilson acts. December 26, 1917, Wilson takes control of the nation's railroads. Harriman has built well, and the government routes huge quantities of vital freight over his rails. And then, it's over over there and Johnny does come marching home. The railroads are returned to their owners. The Los Angeles Limited leaving on track five. The Los Angeles Limited, track passenger train in the 20s. Overland Limited, the Columbine, the Gold Coast Limited. These are the great trains. Six million Americans ride Union Pacific passenger trains in 1922. Flappers walk down the aisles, take the grand tour of the American West. A little soot from the coal burner up front. Enjoy the luxury of a hot shower at 60 miles per hour across the Wyoming plains. Hairdos, the latest fashion. Jazz time, the cat's pajamas, America revels. Industry grows. The automobile is in its infancy. So are the roads. And railroads reach their peak as the great carriers of people on the move. A nation enjoying the fruits of its industry. And in the men's clubroom car, by special wire, the latest stock market reports. Stock market reports. 1929. And it all grinds to a halt. The Great Depression. Unemployed thousands are put to work paving a network of roads for a nation that is fast taking to the rubber tire and giving up the steel wheel. Fighting back, Union Pacific introduces the world's first streamliner, 1934. Calls it the city of Salina. She tours the nation. What a marvel. She'll do 110. But the rubber tire is here to stay. Slowly, the depression years pass to be replaced by a new and greater threat to the nation's security. On December 7th, 1941, along with the rest of the nation, the railroad goes to war again. Through the blowing wheat fields of Nebraska, the pace quickens. 25 new, massive, big boy steam locomotives, largest in the world, to move Sherman tanks and blockbusters, Norden bomb sites and K rations. Twice the tonnage of the First World War, troop trains, an endless stream. And 
then it's over. Today, the golden spike rests in a safe in the Stanford Museum at Palo Alto, California. The place of its driving is a National Historic Monument. The immigrant home seeker trains have long since carried their last load of hopeful settlers west. The west is settled, but no one on the railroad is nostalgic. These are third generation solid state computers. We have them locked in with more than 150 teleprocessing input stations located all over the railroad from here to California. The computer's job is to analyze exactly what's happening at all points, at all times, second by second. Yesterday, we brought the pioneers. Today, we're building the West with new industry. That's one of Union Pacific's industrial development districts down there. One of many. Oil and gas along with coal, iron, soda ash, chemicals, uranium, and many other minerals are all part of Union Pacific's big stake in natural resource development in the West. North Platte, Nebraska. Those Irishmen wintered here, but I don't think any of the old boys would recognize this. From here, I can control two engines, switching into 60 tracks down that hump making up 60 different trains. I say I can control. I should say that electronic computer back there, it's pretty much automatic. We've seen the steam engine come and go. There's a lot of this nation's history wrapped up in those rails, and a lot more of its future. Building. A million new homes next year. Most of the lumber carried on those rails. Growing. The steel carried on those rails. A vital part of the West. A community of interest. Moving. <laughs> 